to run that you'd normally assign to root, just to keep it in a centralized place. We look at cron tab and we see it includes a few defaults for shell, path, mail to, and home. So whenever these items run, they will include or run the bash shell with the following path, messages, success or failure messages will be sent to root, and the home directory is the root of the file system. After that, we see entries for hourly, daily, weekly, and monthly, the items that we just completed talking about. Each item includes the columns we've mentioned, minute, hour, day of the month, month, day of the week. So for example, cron hourly items will run one minute after every hour, every day of the month, every month, every day of the week. An asterisk means execute for every instance. So note, asterisk or wildcard in a column means, or in a time column, means to run for all values. So in the case of the first entry, there are asterisks in four of the five columns indicating that for all of those times, providing it meets one minute after all those times, then the process will run. So every day of the week, Sunday through Saturday, every month, 1 through 12, every day of the month, 1 through 31, every hour, 0 through 23, providing it's one minute after the hour, execute cron.hourly processes. Cron.daily entries are executed four hours and two minutes for every other item, such as day of the month, month, day of the week. Cron.weekly entries are executed on Sundays at 4 a.m. and 22 minutes. Cron.monthly entries are executed, as you can see, we've got minute, hour, day of the month. The first day of the month, 4 hours and 42 minutes. Now we can append to the cron tab file our own entries, or we can do so to individual users. So we should note as a fifth feature that cron maintains per user and system-wide schedules. We've just looked at the system-wide schedule, which is located in ETC cron tab, which references the daily, hourly, weekly, and monthly items. Per user, however, items are stored in the var spool directory, the var spool cron tabs directory. So per user cron tabs are stored in var spool cron tabs. Let's take a brief look to see if there are any entries defined. And there we see cron is empty, so that's var spool cron is empty. So with that said, our first task is to create a cron tab entry or cron entry for the user student one. A simple job will suffice and we'll do so where student one exists. Let's grep student one from ETC password to be sure this user exists and the user does. So first and foremost, we'll S you in as the user. Once it is student one, we'll execute cron tab dash E to edit our cron tab entry, which will be blank initially. So cron tab dash E. This will launch the default editor, which generally is VI. Now we're in VI. If you're not familiar with VI and would like a different editor, export the editor variable, setting it to something like nano. And then we'll re-execute crontab-e. And it brings up the schedule in nano. Now once in nano, you indicate the key columns minus the username column because this cron tab entry will ultimately be saved as a cron tab entry for the user student one. So step C, create an entry minus the name of the user. 
So that means all of the columns that define time, as well as the command. But we need a command to run in order for this to work. So in a separate shell, let's go ahead and sun as student1. We'll su as root first, and then sun as student1, and then create a script as student1. So we need something to do. Well, let's run up time and see what's of interest. When we run up time, and this is a script that we like to write because it's easy, works well, we see that it produces useful information. How about if we wanted the load average information? Well, this gives us a good opportunity to take advantage of awk in a shell script. So up time, piping the output to awk, parsing out some key columns. Since these columns are delimited by space, we'll count out as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th, 6th, 7th, Let's say we want 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th columns. So we'll awk print 8, 9, 10, and column 11. Let's see how this works out. So the load average is returned. We're missing one item, apparently. Let's go ahead and get column 12 as well. Now we have all of the load averages. Now supposing we wanted to store this information for further processing at a later time, but we want the system to do it using cron. Take this series of commands, which includes uptime and awk, and create a script. We'll do so in the shell environment since we're logged in on the desktop as Linux CBT. So we'll nano and we'll reference using a shebang header bin bash and then paste as our first item the following. But we want to send this to a file using a pen redirection. So we'll append, and we can define a file name if we'd like. Let's call the file name load average. Or load averages plural, and then send our output using a pen redirection into file name. And before we commit this shell script to cron, we'll be sure to test it. So let's save it. We'll call it load averages. Dot shell. And then we need to flag it as executable. So we'll change mod, plus x, load averages, and then lsl to be sure that it's executable. Now let's try to run it. Dot forward slash load averages. We'll echo the exit status, and it seems to have run successfully creating the load averages file. We'll less it, and there we see the load average. It's always a good idea whenever creating cron scripts, however, to reference the full path. So let's modify it once more and indicate that the file name will be home student1 and let's be sure that student1's home directory is indeed in home so we'll exit this entry and it's actually home1 we made a change so it's going to be home1 student1 load averages dot text let's try to execute it again to be sure that it works always test your scripts before committing them to cron for obvious reasons and we miss student1 in the name of the file name. So let's modify load averages dot shell script again and that's student1, save the changes, and then try it again. And we're obviously missing it. Let's see where we are. And it's home student1, so we definitely, but this is on the local system, so we've got it mixed up with the remote system. That's why the difference. So let's log out of this shell, SSH over to the remote system, since that's where we're working. That's the reason for the confusion. Then SUN is student1. And now we can create the load averages script. So let's copy it or start over creating it either or since we have it local we'll get it from our local instance from a separate window then we'll scp load averages dot shell 
over to 192.168 or we could simply cat it. Let's cat the contents just to save time as it's a simple script. It's just a three-liner. Then on the remote system we'll nano load averages dot shell paste the items and then test it by change modding plus x load averages dot shell and then trying to execute it where we see that it has run successfully and a cat of load averages